Um, well, it's my pleasure, everyone, to introduce my good friend, Summit Agarwal. Uh, Summit is one of these guys that I think really embodies um, how you can succeed both in, in government as well as the private sector and make a real difference. So uh, you guys have read his bio, so I'll give just a very short highlights and save the time for, for his comments. But uh, uh, out of MIT, he decided to join the US Air Force as part of uh, Cyber Command and one of the first officers in network warfare. Uh, I think he spent almost 20 years uh, then as a, as a National Guardsman. Uh, but then in his private sector, have done a number of amazing things. Uh, headed up mobile at Google, uh, then went back into the Pentagon, was the youngest DASD, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense ever in the Pentagon. Uh, but then most recently has built up a company uh, called Shape Security, which is one of the leading cybersecurity companies in the country. Uh, and earlier this year, they sold it for over a billion dollars to F5, where he now, now is. So he's got great private sector and, and public background. So Summit, uh, I'm going to ask the first few questions, and we're going to turn it over to questions from uh, the class. But the first one is, can you just walk us through your journey of your decisions to decide to go surf? Why did you join the military? Why did you go back into the Pentagon? Help us walk through your journey. Yeah, sure. So my family is an immigrant family. Uh, I was born in India and we came here and there was always this issue of belonging. And one of the ways that I felt like people could really belong was by tying themselves into the national identity of the country that was their new adopted homeland. And nothing felt more tightly bound up than it's military. It's, it's core function of preserving that culture and that way of life. Uh, that was one element of it. The other element of it was that I absolutely loved the idea of flying in all of its forms. And Raj, as you know, I wish I'd had your military career in some ways rather than mine. I was a network warfare officer rather than an actual uh, you know, combat pilot officer, but that's okay. That's a different story. So between those two things, it really was um, a case of just wanting to be part of the identity of the country and uh, that opportunity to join the Air Force and to be part of the military, to go all over the world on deployments, to see so many different things and understand how our country interacts with so many others um, has been amazing. I mean, absolutely a situation where I have gotten far more out of service than I've ever put in. And I certainly tried my best, but it just gives you back so much more that it is really hard to compare the two. Thanks, Emmett. And then, <clears throat> then you've switched over to the private sector and uh, Maybe you could give us all a view of what are trends in, in cybersecurity? What are you seeing uh, attackers do? What do you see, uh, that, what do you think defenders need to do? Uh, and in particular, you know, I know you've spent a, a lot of time trying to define the future of, uh, of identity and, and truth uh, on, the, on the internet. Would love to hear an overview of that. Sure, sure. I believe and have always believed that the way we are going about creating safety and security online, particularly in the area of cybersecurity and cybercrime, isn't quite rational. If you think about the four natural domains of land, sea, air, and space, nobody is told that they need to go defend themselves against foreign nation states, against very, very sophisticated organized criminal gangs, against the absolute worst that the world can throw at them. We have a Coast Guard that defends uh, you know, our, our borders. We have Army, Navy, Air Force for land, sea, air, and space. But in cybersecurity, any business of any size, any individual, anyone from a small business with 10 million in revenue all the way up to a giant bank like JP Morgan Chase is really at the end of the day, fully subjected to the worst that foreign nations, that adversaries of any sort, that organized criminal gangs can throw their way. And that makes no sense to me. That flavor of thinking about security is absolutely at odds with how we think about security in the four natural domains. And so the result of that is actually what one would predict if you think about that mismatch. The result is that we are less secure in the fifth domain of cyberspace than we are in many ways, at least in the United States, we're very fortunate to have a relatively safe society in the four natural domains. So you end up with companies that are losing more money online 
losing more assets that belong to them, more customer data that they're entrusted with than they would ever lose in an offline context. And so that's a really strange thing. In the domain that we created, we are having a harder time safeguarding and securing ourselves than we do in the natural domains. And I think that's a matter of understanding who has the authorities and the norms to defend, who has the right to defend, who has the obligation to defend. So that was my thesis when I left the Pentagon in 2011. And what we set about to do was to create a military grade capability that would do a better job of defending large corporations, medium businesses, small businesses than they could ever do on their own. And we intentionally mimicked a lot of the ways in which the military and the Department of Defense think about security, concentration of force against a very specific problem, the ability to aggregate the resources of a great many companies into a single defensive capability. So a lot of national security and safeguarding the four natural domains are what drove our thinking when we created a private sector company meant to safeguard private sector companies you know, throughout society. Raj, you asked like three different questions, but I can't memorize all of them as quickly as you can speak. So why don't you Well, um, what, what trends are you seeing that uh, attackers are, are, are doing? Oh, that's the kind of most interesting part of it. They are always doing, uh, are always going after the softest targets. So in many ways, the softest target is everybody on this call. It's everybody in society. The people who are least capable of defending themselves against sophisticated attackers are not the large corporations that have billion dollar cybersecurity budgets that have IT staffs and teams of professionals. It's either small businesses uh, or individuals. So the number one thing that we see attackers doing is emulating real people. And Raj alluded to this when he talked about my work in identity and the idea of real versus fake on the internet. You know, in 1993, there was that old New Yorker cartoon with the dog logging onto a computer and it said on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. But ironically, 27 plus years later, on the internet, no one knows if you're joe.filter at Gmail or Raj Shah at, you know, diux.co or whatever, you can to be almost anybody that you want to be. And it is so easy to social engineer, to fish, to put malware on someone's machine and to gain access to the things that represent their identity. I sort of jokingly and disparagingly call it two strings and a sticky note. If you have a note that has someone's username and their password, you effectively got their identity. There's no holographic bear in the upper left corner. There's no signature in the background. There's no watermark. There's no special place that can take just those photos. I mean, it's literally less secure than college kids cutting photos out to get into bars with identities that don't belong to them on a driver's license. It's that insecure. And so amazingly, the internet still works despite this profound lack of true security. Uh, but the trend that I always follow is how do you tell what's real from what's fake? And so what shaped it and what I think are macro trends on the internet are, is the thing interacting with you a human or a non-human? So much of what criminals do is really about writing programs and bots that simulate human behavior to do human-like things. Um, they then use those stolen identities to have what is truly a fully synthetic actor. It's a little bot has some aspect of your identity and it will run around on the internet trying to log into something or trying to represent itself as you. And the impact of this is far worse than the economic harm of losing $1,000 in actually not every single night. There are probably hundreds of millions of dollars being lost on a quarterly basis in every single major bank in America and no consumer knows about it because those funds are silently put back. No bank wants you to know how porous the banking environment is. They simply want to absorb those losses so that you don't lose confidence. And that's actually okay from a societal point of view. A far worse aspect of the usage of synthetic identities is what we call coordinated inauthentic behavior, CIB. And that is getting on Facebook, getting on Twitter, getting on TikTok and creating what appears to be a groundswell of activity and effort and belief around a particular ideology, a particular idea, a concept. So even right now in our election, there is coordinated inauthentic behavior that is pushing ideas and concepts that are driven 
by actors that are trying to interfere in our election. There's less of that happening, we believe, this year, 2020, than in 2016. In 2016, it was absolutely rampant. So what happens when there's a discourse that amongst 330 million US persons, and let's just focus on one country at a time, this problem is international, interference by coordinated inauthentic behavior. When that just tens of millions of actions, likes and posts and clicks and forwards that are inauthentic, you can end up is a perversion of democracy or a perversion of any form of government that a country ought to have the sovereign right to pursue. So this idea of real versus fake is incredibly pernicious. And it's something that I think uh, is worthy of a lot of time and attention by anybody that, uh, that wants to pursue a career in cybersecurity. Raj, do you want me to touch on some of the questions that folks are asking in the chat? There's some good questions in there. Yeah, sure. Feel free to, to jump in on those questions and then, uh, yeah, absolutely. Why don't you start with that? Sure. So the first question is from Lee and uh, the question is about deep fakes and how we can stay ahead of this in terms of defense. That is a really, really challenging problem. Uh, so far, there are a few technological solutions that have been able to kind of do frame by frame and pixel by pixel comparison and figure out when various kinds of algorithms are being used to create fake motion, to make a mouth move such that it's saying words other than what was said in the original video. Same for images, uh, but I'm not really aware, like it's an emerging space of what the fundamental long-term defense is going to be against deep fakes. I can guess how we will create more security around official communication. Like if I wanted to have an official White House video or even an official video from me, I know how I could create that. There are actually long-standing concepts that have nothing to do with cybersecurity that you could actually use. A lot of what we use in cybersecurity for defensive capability are actually analogs that have worked in the offline world. But here's what I can't really think of a good solution to. How do you solve the problem that there is no real authentication mechanism when a video or a photo is being shared and propagated and virally explodes on social media? No thing to say, is this authentic? Uh, does it have the right watermarks and digital fingerprints when it is content that's being generated by users? So I think what we're gonna end up with is the following dynamic. Official communication, like a video of Biden or a video of Trump, is eventually going to have enough watermarking and fingerprinting technology that the major social media platforms will be able to verify authenticity. Uh, you could even use blockchain related concepts to say, here's the original source of that video that's been uploaded to the public blockchain, and we know how to verify against that. The part that I have a lot more difficulty with is user generated content. What if the video that we care about is not necessarily that of a famous person or of a person who has all of the in their video? Then I think it's going to be hard for us to decide whether that video is real or fake. So very, very complicated space that's still emerging. Uh, that's a good question. This makes me not want to be on the internet and go hiding. In a lot of people who work in security feel like the thing they want to do next is not be on the internet at all. Um, I have a very limited online banking footprint and no joke. I mean, there's only so many things I need to do and I don't need to have all of that stuff connected all the time. Uh, you really need to think about convenience versus insecurity. Question from Luis is, uh, to what degree of frequency is this also happening with foreign attackers stealing IP from the US? So that is a huge problem in any liberal democracy because they tend to be very open. This is a problem in Taiwan. It's a problem in the US. Um, the signature, heat signature for a particular engine that was to be installed on a jet that a guy like Raj would fly was stolen. And that was meant to be a top secret classified piece of information. It was stolen from one of the hundred defense contractors that are distributed across every state in America. And for those of you that don't, don't know, the way that large defense contractors ensure support politically for their projects is they make sure that their factories and their development centers are distributed across the entire country. So you've got a lot of these centers in every state in the union uh, that are not as well safeguarded as say NSA, not as well safeguarded as a major defense contracting headquarter in the national capital region. So that small company was penetrated and those heat signatures were stolen. And what that means is 
that an adversary is able to tune the tracking for the missiles that are meant to shoot down that airplane. So this theft of IP, whether it's for national security and defense, whether it's for things that are much less sort of dramatic, like cutting edge quantum computing, cutting edge chip design is unfortunately happening to a great degree all the time. Raj, I'm gonna turn it back to you for a little bit. Sure. Um... Uh, I'll ask uh, I'll ask one more and then uh, well actually you know what I'm going to turn it over to Joe I think Joe had a question and then I'll, I'll say thanks, something. Brian. So th thanks again for joining us. It's just fascinating. <clears throat> um, so I, I actually have a son that's at West Point. He just declared his major as computer science, and they have a pretty new branch of service called the, the Cyber Corps. You know, so I just wondering if he's going to get commissioned in a few years, maybe four years out, he might report to his first cyber unit. You know, could, what are some of the developments in, in cyber technologies that you think might you change the way he does offense and defense as, as a young cyber officer. Sure. I know there are two technological ones that I'll cite. Uh, the first one is uh, homomorphic encryption. So we're getting to the point where the compute burden on being able to take two numbers, let's just take the number one and the number two, and let's encrypt them. We don't want anyone to know what two numbers we're adding together. And we want to add them to get the solution, which is three. In the traditional way, you have to share keys, exchange secrets with whoever you want to be able to perform that computation. They decrypt the two numbers, add them up, get the solution three, and they encrypt the answer, and then they transmit that back to you. So that's the old school way of doing things. And it has two fundamental problems. One, it's vulnerable because you have to decrypt the things that were meant to be secret at all. Anywhere in the process, if you have to decrypt them, that's problematic. And the second is you have to exchange secrets with anybody that you wanna do business with. That is fine at a limited scale when you have a small number of partners, but when you want to have kind of a heterogeneous environment, maybe international coalition, it's too many parties to be exchanging secrets easily. It doesn't scale very well. So for a long time, DARPA has been chasing after this idea of being able to perform computation on encrypted data without decrypting it. And the problem was that as of 2010, when I was at DOD, there was a 10 to the sixth compute penalty. So a million X compute penalty on adding the number one and the number two together if you left them encrypted. And so over the last 10 years, we've been knocking down that exponent. And I think we're right on the verge. Certainly, I think, Joe, by the time your son gets out, we'll be kind of at the level of 10 to the first or 10 to the second. And that's a very tolerable cost for fully encrypted compute without having to decrypt uh, the underlying data. That's one exciting area. And the other one is quantum computing. I mean, we're getting very, very close to the point that commercial computing, even at the very high end, certainly for defense and DOD may be available. And that is going to change everything about security online because everything about security online today is about computational expense of factoring very large prime numbers, right? That simple concept of a gigantic prime number and the difficulty of finding such gigantic primes is the core of modern cybersecurity. And quantum computing gives you so much more capacity that you can in fact find many more such primes. So those are two kind of very near-term trends that I think someone like your son should uh, look into. I'll pass it on, thanks so much. Awesome, uh, Steve? Sure. Um, thanks, Raj, and great to have you, Summit. It's, uh, um, you know, we were just having a discussion this, this morning, actually, at, at, at a Five Eyes conference about the limited ability of people to go um, uh, out of the government and, and then actually come back in. But you've kind of come back in by, by doing a major service and, and just building a, a private company that, that does a lot of this stuff. And it, it just makes me think, and, and, uh, and, and maybe you could offer to the class, Knowing what you know now from inside and outside, how would you have architected a, a better cyber system for the government? And I don't mean the technology. I just mean who should own what and given the multiple layers of, you know, securing infrastructure, securing private uh, networks, and then securing us from disinformation. Do you have some high level bits you've been pondering that you'd like to share? Well, so there's several different pieces in there, Steve. Thanks for the great question. Let me try to pick apart a few of them. So let's talk about um, first part of your question, which was how would you architect a more secure uh, environment? Yep. Do you mean that question for all of society or just for sort of national security DOD? No, I, you know, I think I, I'm implicitly getting to the point is that we've, 
we've tended to historically to bifurcate the two and I'm not sure that's working well, but that's my own bias, is how would you actually architect it now that we know that those things overlap, or at least I believe they overlap, how would you architect one that actually did the right thing for the country? Or maybe you believe it, yeah, that I it's okay the way it is. No, go ahead, go finish. No, maybe. No, 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 it's definitely not okay the way it is. I mean, I think it's, it's if the military said, hey, we protect US citizens as long as they're hanging out on a military base. But if you're not on a military base, you are totally exposed to any form of threat that can possibly exist in the world. Right. That is absurd in the real no, world, but that, that is basically, right. Right. that's so attacking, you, exactly, in cyber. So how would you build, a, given what you know now, what would you build? I think that there are um, two or three fundamental components to it. The first one is we as a society have spy agencies like NSA that have the preponderance of cybersecurity expertise and capability at the national level. There really are not a lot of other agencies that have that level of expertise. So what you end up with is a choice that we as a society have been unwilling to make, which is do we let a spy agency safeguard us domestically at home on the internet, or do we say, hey, DHS, Department of Homeland Security is the only one chartered with the mission and having the authorities to safeguard US persons or people at home. Um, that choice is profoundly broken because DHS does not have the necessary level of capability. So with the benefit of hindsight, I think what we need is an agency that has every bit the level of technological expertise that NSA does in the area of cybersecurity that is not a spy agency. And that agency would need to have the titles and the authority and the charter to protect US persons. And you see that same dichotomy in the FBI versus the CIA. CIA is entirely externally facing. It's effectively a spy agency. FBI is all about domestic issues that exist you know, primarily at home. So that is a very clear, bright, shiny line, which we didn't really realize in the 80s and 90s was going to become such a problem. But at this point, we have two unpalatable choices. You can let a spy agency be in charge, or you can let DHS, which has the be in charge, but doesn't have the expertise. And so what you end up with is no defense. So that's what I would do at the national level in terms of creating an agency and organizing things differently and better. On the second piece, which is sort of how do you create a little bit more clarity between what's real and what's fake? I think that that is very challenging because anonymity is a key cherished belief system and value online. Like we all prize privacy and anonymity. So if you sort of swing the pendulum over to say, we would have a lot more secure online experience if everybody had a hard identity and you needed to basically jack your driver's license into a little key card reader in order to get online, you would have a more secure environment. You would have a lot less um, vitriol. You'd have a lot less trolling. You'd have a lot less of the nasty things that we don't like online, including crime. But what you would lose is anonymity and privacy. And I think that it is very hard to know a cat card for a cat card for civilians is that what you're suggesting well that's what we use in the military right so on the private version of the internet that the military has called the nippernet or the sippernet every single time you get online you insert a physical card into a physical reader and that card by the way has to be attached to your body all of the other times you literally wear it clipped onto your lapel or around your neck or in your wallet like it's a big deal it's a physical hard token there's no anonymity and there's no privacy uh, for individuals using the nippernet or the sippernet. So Steve, I'm not sure if there's a good answer uh, that I have ready made that says, how would I balance the reality that it's a totally insecure wild, wild west on the internet with the idea that the privacy and anonymity of the internet, at least in many countries, if not all, is really important. It's allowed the internet to be a tool of great good, not just great bad. And, well, thank you. I think that was a great question. And in fact, Joe, if you don't mind, Johannes uh, had a had a question, which I think is almost a perfect follow up for that. Um, are, are you OK, Joe, to go to Johannes's question? Yeah. Johannes, do you want to ask it yourself? Uh, well, sure. I guess my question really was about sort of constitutional protections in the United States um, and whether that puts us at a disadvantage compared to adversaries that might not share values, uh, whether that's in sort of building strong encryption domestically that you know, goes against national security surveillance interests, or whether that's in sort of a lack of training data that other countries can collect on their citizens? 
I think that the answer is 100% yes, that at a tactical level in a short period of time, I perceive that some of those constitutional freedoms are putting us at a slight disadvantage. I mean, if a national security entity wanted to build some great new AI capability and didn't have to worry about any constitutional protections, it could just get any data it wanted, go scrape Facebook, et cetera, some of which is happening anyway, but let's just take it to do it at a larger scale, we'd be able to go faster. So I think that the answer to your question in my less about cybersecurity in particular and more about liberal democracies. I mean, I think that we have done a better job of fighting COVID. Uh, I know of other countries where if there are three cases in one city, they'll wall off that city immediately. And so that's not something that's easy to do politically or from the uh, perspective of the rights of people in the US, but it sure has done a great job of helping uh, corral COVID. So I think that the, the question is absolutely the case that at a short-term tactical level, it is disadvantageous. I think that the question that is scary and exciting is, do liberal democracies do better than more authoritarian regimes over a much longer period of time? Because when it comes to getting something done that you don't need to develop political will around, which you don't need to to the same degree in an authoritarian regime, tactically, I think they get it done better. Great, Joe? Yeah, I guess we'll go to Raj, back to you to call whoever right. up in the queue here. We're letting Raj drive today. Sure, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's do that. Um, see, Janani um, had a question. Thank you, Professor. So my question was a little bit twofold. One was I was wondering if you think China will outpace the DOD in terms of quantum computing and AI capabilities. And then also if you think cyber warfare will eventually have a lower threshold for use than traditional warfare and whether that's a threat we should be focusing on. I think those are great questions. Uh, I don't have a particularly informed opinion about the race in quantum computing. I think that all countries, uh, or major countries are all kind of in that struggle to do better. I think we have a lot of motivation both in the private sector and at the government level. So I think it's hard to say who's going to do better in the short term and who's going to have more capability in the long term. I think that one of uh, the United States chief sources of power was actually soft, it was cultural power. And that power is fading very, very dramatically uh, over the last 15 years. I mean, Korea um, is starting to export music to a degree that was just unimaginable 15 years ago. I mean, K-pop is taking over the world. Um, a lot of companies in the US are now becoming uh, you know, the US version of a Chinese company um, or a Russian company rather than calling the Chinese company by the US name. So I think there's a very amazing kind of rebalancing of power. Uh, the second question I think is even more interesting because I used to joke around with nuke officers um, and other people who were in strategic deterrence related fields and say, listen, I get that your field is really exciting and interesting on some level. I get that you know, we could annihilate ourselves, but we all know we're not gonna do that. And so my field, is absolutely going to see a lot more of what we consider hot war in our lifetimes than your field. And uh, so that was sort of a conversation over beers that people used to have. Absolutely, I think for better, for worse, the bar is so much lower. Look, the bar is so low that we don't even know half the time who's taking what action. Uh, you don't have to disclose what action you're taking. You can quietly cause some um, centrifuges to spin too fast and destroy them and suddenly you've um, degraded somebody's ability, like Iran's ability to enrich uranium. Uh, there's all kinds of activity going on now that is under the surface. Attribution is one of the biggest concepts in deterrence and in, in military circles. We not only have limited attribution when a nation state takes an action, we have active misinformation and misattribution. I can bounce every single attack through Canada. Is Canada the attacker? I can bounce it through Switzerland. I can bounce it through Kansas. I can bounce it off the computers of US citizens or any citizen of any country. So I think that the concepts that we have used to keep things calm in the real world in the four physical domains, unfortunately erode away to a great deal in the cyber realm because you can do things covertly and secretly with uh, no real attribution. And it's very difficult to take retaliatory action and deter that behavior. That's great, Summit. Um, you know, we, we're down to the last couple of minutes. So I'm going to ask a similar question I've been asking of all the, uh, 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 the panelists. So uh, some of the, uh, 
the students uh, are going to do a final project where they're going to look to the future of what conflict might look like in 10, 15 years. And we're gonna look at it across technologies and look at it across processes. And obviously cyber will be a big, a big um, piece, of, uh, piece of that. Uh, you know, given, uh, as you described, how much of both the infrastructure, the activity, the targets, meaning banking uh, in cyber are all civilian and private sector in nature, right? What do you think needs to be or will be the right type or level of, of interaction between the, the private sector and the government, you know, beyond just acquisition and buying stuff. What, what, do, you, what do you think needs to happen for, for liberal democracies to prevail and, and feel safe? That's a question, uh, maybe not quite so eloquently as you phrased it, that I worry about all the time. I think that the future of warfare is going to be less and less overt, less and less hot. It's going to be less and less about putting kinetics on a target, as, as they like to say in the army. It's going to be about influencing large numbers of people in very subtle ways. If you can influence people, it's that old thing about winning hearts and minds. If you can just influence them in a certain direction, uh, you may be able to win without fighting at all. And so I think uh, I've read a lot about this just at the consumer level about what's happening in Taiwan. I mean, totally open country. And as a result, suffers a lot of influence by foreign actors by virtue of being open. Everybody's allowed to come in and say whatever they want to say. And so, so you end up with a war of ideology and a war of culture in these open countries. So I think that the, uh, the big challenge for liberal democracies is how do we ensure that the conversation we're having is a real conversation and an authentic conversation with the people that we think we're having it with. I think the conversation happening on Facebook right now is incredibly polluted by people who have ill will and ill intention. And so I worry, and probably I'm gonna devote a large number of my career years to figuring out how to kind of stem that tide of inauthentic. And so in terms of what the government can do, I think we're gonna to have to take a more active role. We're going to have to figure out a contract with American society that says, we are the government, we're here to help. And we're gonna do that in a way that you're comfortable letting us help to create a lot more safety and security. And there's a, um, there's a distinction, I think, between policing what happens on a social media platform, that seems very active and heavy handed, versus saying, hey, we have the ability to ensure authenticity without compromising security and privacy. Um, there are a lot of companies that are failing to take steps that are readily uh, attainable that would help with this problem. And so I think that there's also a regulatory component that says you have to safeguard yourself using these technologies that we've identified. Somebody asked a question about NIST and checkbox security. And that's a great example of something that is not really getting us where we need to go. We need a much more robust um, framework that says if you're going to have an online system, this is what security means. I'll give you one of my favorite examples. The carpet under your feet has 50 or 100 years of anti-fire technology woven into every fiber. The doors that separate your bedroom from the hallway or the hallway from the garage are rated for a certain number of hours that they can burn in the event of a fire. So the idea of safety and security in the real world is baked into every component of the physical world with which we interact. That level of intensity has got to go into constructing a major website or a major web platform if you have any hope of it being safe or secure instead of the current regime, which is really everybody do their best and we'll hope it doesn't turn out too bad. Muted, muted brush. I'm on mute, sorry. I guess we have time for, for, for only maybe one more. Um, Summit, what gives you the greatest optimism looking forward? Oh, it's hard to answer that question after the last 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> It's really just qualitative. I mean, I think over the long haul, uh, a freer and more open society, a more liberal society can suffer a lot of bruises and bumps, but can find its way back to um, a civil discourse. Like I think that as much as the brand new tools of communication and aggregation and finding community are creating craziness like QAnon and you know, extremist behavior, I think that there is still an opportunity 
for some better version, some good version of communication, collaboration, and people coming together to exist. I just think that it's really hard to point to quantitative examples of that right now, given the amount of negative stuff that has really taken hold on the internet and the degree to which these tools are being used for negative purposes rather than positive purposes. But I just, I do believe, I don't know if I can cite something that gives me the optimism, but I just believe that we will get there and that these are growing pains and that the growing pains unfortunately take a decade or two decades or three decades to work their way through the system. But the entire modern internet, the way we know it, is barely 25 years old. So it's barely a young adult. Uh, there's a lot of stories still left to be told. Awesome. Thank you, Simon. That was that was great. Joe, I'll turn it over to you to wrap up the class. Um, so I'm just safe for the just captivating response. That. Thanks so much for sharing your insights. It's really just been fascinating and a, a lot to think about. Uh, you know, we've got some final projects coming up, I think can be in, informed by this. We may even uh, reach out to you for, for a few few tweaks, but uh, really just extraordinary. Thank, thanks for, for making time for us.